In today's video presentation, we will be discussing the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, also known as FERPA. While many of you may be vaguely familiar with FERPA and what it entails, I wanted to take some time today to share a basic overview of what it is, how it has changed in recent years, and how its policies affect students and their families, as well as staff at our school. Let's first start with some definitions. First of all, do you know what FERPA is? According to the U.S. Department of Education, FERPA is a federal law that protects the privacy of student education records maintained by or on behalf of educational agencies or institutions. It applies to all educational agencies, school districts, and institutions that receive government funding. Under this act, parents are provided with the right to access their children's education records. Parents have a right to request to have those records amended or withheld from certain entities if they deem necessary. They can do so by signing an opt-out form at enrollment. These rights transfer to the student when he or she turns 18. When FERPA was established in 1974, it stated that schools are responsible for the data of their students and no one should have access to that data besides parents, students, and third-party service providers. It should be noted that this act was established with the understanding that the laws and regulations also would apply to those providers to protect student data. In order to better understand what FERPA covers, let's first discuss the differences between students' education records and directory information. Education records include information that is maintained by the school and that is directly related to a student. Directory information is more basic and is not considered harmful if it is disclosed. Some examples of education records include report cards, transcripts, disciplinary records, and class schedules. Directory information, on the other hand, includes things like the student's name, address, email address, phone number, date of birth, and information about students' participation in activities and sports, which can actually include their height and weight. Also included are dates of attendance at the specific school or institution, grade level or classification, enrollment status, field of study, and degrees or awards received. When it comes to disclosing information, it is important also to have a clear understanding of who is considered a school official versus who is considered a third-party service provider, as both may have the ability to access and share information in different capacities. Those that are considered school officials may include, but not only teachers, principals, and school secretaries, board members, and counselors, but it also includes school attorneys, accountants, those that work in the human resources department, IT specialists, and other support or clerical personnel. Third-party service providers can include contractors, consultants, and volunteers who work directly with students. Let's talk about the school's responsibilities next. The school and its administrators are respons responsible for raising FERPA awareness and making sure all employees understand their role in protecting students' private information. The school should also train employees to know the rights, protections, and exceptions, meaning school employees should know what data exists in an education record, who has the rights to view records, and what the limits are for sharing that data. Furthermore, the school also has an obligation to choose compliant vendors that understand their duties and obligations to protect student data. Additionally, schools should implement policies and procedures that make it easier for staff to comply. While in theory this is all good and well, there are some common FERPA violations that educators have been known to commit. Improper disposal of student records. For hard copies, this means educators may simply throw papers away instead of shredding them. We'll discuss some ways to properly dispose of digital records in just a moment. Another common mistake is forgetting to screen vendors to make sure that they are FERPA compliant. Many people don't realize that this can even include online vendors like apps and websites that offer free services to teachers and students. Educators have also been known to deny parents access to student records, and some have also gotten in trouble for posting student information or data on social media. 
According to the U.S. Department of Education, most of the complaints they receive involve isolated incidents that were committed inadvertently. Oftentimes, their response will involve assisting the educational agency or institution to improve its policies and practices in order to bring them into compliance and to help prevent future incidents. However, the Department of Education will conduct full formal investigations when deemed necessary and appropriate. It would be very rare that a school would purposely refuse to comply, but in that rare event, the Department of Education would have the right to withhold federal funds from the school. Let's talk now about disposal of student records. There are three methods for clearing out or disposing of student records. These include clearing, purging, and destroying. It's important to consult your school policy before doing any of these methods, as schools will often specify where and for how long student records are to be kept electronically. As we have discussed, FERPA violations are not unheard of, and although efforts to educate parents, students, and staff on FERPA have increased in recent years, there is still some gray area surrounding FERPA and how it plays into certain special circumstances. It's important to know that exceptions may be made to the FERPA Act if and when a student's safety is at stake. Designated personnel and law enforcement officers can legally access students' records when it comes to safety issues, provided that the sharing of such information is necessary in order to protect the health or safety of other people or students involved in an emergency situation. Speaking of safety, a common area of confusion for many school administrators is whether or not footage from surveillance cameras is covered under FERPA. Considering that almost all high schools in the United States now have security cameras on the premises, it's important for school administrators to know and do the following. Here's what administrators should know. The Fourth Amendment prohibits government entities, including public schools, from conducting unreasonable searches. This means that recordings made in public spaces like school hallways, stairwells, school buses, parking lots, and classrooms with low expectations of privacy are considered constitutional, while recordings made in private locations like bathrooms and locker rooms are considered an unconstitutional invasion of privacy. Administrators should also know that audio surveillance recordings are prohibited unless the parties being recorded have provided consent to be recorded. Images captured on surveillance recordings qualify as education records if and when a photo or video is directly related to a student and therefore parents may request access to photos and videos that involve their children. Law enforcement officers, however, are prohibited from viewing surveillance photos and videos until they have the written consent from the parents of the students to whom the recording directly relates. Let's talk next about what schools should do. Schools should develop and publish policies describing the purpose and locations of surveillance cameras. This can be done through their handbooks, websites, newsletters, or even by putting up signage around the school. It's a good idea for schools to only install cameras in public areas, not in private areas. And they should avoid surveillance systems that enable audio recording. Many schools and third-party entities use surveys and questionnaires to collect student data and information. It's important to know that students and their parents have a right to opt out of surveys, tests, or other processes that make them feel uncomfortable. They also have the right to ask the school questions, such as, who is conducting the study? What is the purpose of the study? Is any personally identifiable information required? Who is compiling, reviewing, and storing the data? When is the data destroyed? And they might also ask, what are the consequences if my child does not participate? Let's take a look at how immigrants are protected under FERPA. According to COPA, which is the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates, schools are required to provide equal access to education for all children within their district boundaries, regardless of parents or guardians' citizenship or immigration status. Stool, excuse me, schools do not have a right to inquire about the student's citizenship or immigration status, 
which means that they cannot technically require social security numbers and birth certificates in order for a family to enroll. They can, however, ask the family to show proof that they currently reside within the district boundaries. This can be done by presenting a utility bill or other official paperwork or documentation of their current address. Finally, there has long been confusion over whether or not military recruiters have free and open access to students' records. While public schools are obligated to share directory information with military recruiters, parents do have a right under FERPA to opt out of military recruitment efforts by telling the school that they do not wish to have their children's contact information shared in this way. Now that we have discussed what FERPA is, what the school's responsibilities are for complying with FERPA, and how to handle special circumstances and exceptions, I hope that you all have a renewed understanding and confidence when it comes to protecting our students and their personal information. Here are my resources for today's presentation. Thank you for watching.